for me, it's really important and I feel really passionate about sharing our story because when it happened to us, there was very limited information and I felt quite isolated. And it's so important to share it, to show that, look, the message is there is hope out there. Hi, my name is Caroline Swain and I was five weeks pregnant when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Roland and I met um, just at a disco. <laughs> we were both out with our friends and uh, spotted each other and liked the look of each other and got chatting. I was um, 34 and uh, Caroline must have been 31, so um, it's not as if it was the you know, first time for either of us. So uh, I think we, uh, as Caroline, we both knew what we were looking for. We met in June and in November Roland's proposed to me so within a year then on the day that we met we actually got married. I'm Max. I'm Luke. We sometimes go over to the park for tennis and yeah. we play on the computers together. I'm probably better than Max on console games. Like He doesn't get off the Xbox when I'm trying to watch something on TV. Max is constantly on my back. Having a family for Roland and I was extremely important. We'd both discussed it. We didn't wait that long because... How old was I, Roland? <laughs> <laughs> I was 31. So, um, you know, we thought, well, we better not wait too long. About a year after we got married, um, I fell pregnant with our first son, with Max. Having Max changed our lives, uh, as a, uh, any new parent would appreciate, um, completely. And we used to take it in turns to, you know, to get up and check on him. So by sharing it, that did help. When um, Max was only one year old, I discovered a lump in my breast. I had actually been breastfeeding him. I decided that I wanted to breastfeed him for a year. And because the milk had depleted out of my breast, then I noticed this lump. And I went to the GP, who then rushed to scan this report to the hospital. And that made me a little bit nervous that the GP was rushing to get this report scanned over to the hospital. I could tell immediately that she went in and when she came out, you know, that there was something wrong because she looked very, very upset. For me, sitting in the waiting room, one of the things that struck me about sitting in the, and waiting for it was that most people who get breast cancer are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and I suppose we were in, the, in our 30s. So it felt a little bit out of place to start off with, a little bit unusual. It was all very scary because it felt like we were waiting for quite a long time and I guessed that something was wrong. And when the nurse came back out to us to say we need to go back in and see the consultant after the scan had been done, the room filled up with people and there was the nurses and the doctor and I could tell something wasn't quite right and that's when they said um, that I had breast cancer. At that point I didn't know that I was pregnant so Roland and I obviously needed to come to terms or get our heads around this shocking news. You hear about it happening to other people, but you never expect it to be yourself. And it was very scary when they're talking about your chances of survival for the next five years when you're at 35, thinking obviously you've still got a lot of all your life ahead of you. And with our own, you know, with our little you know, Max, who'd only just turned 12 months. Then they asked at the time, are you likely to be pregnant? And even though Roland and I had been trying for another baby because we wanted a, you know, a bigger family, I didn't feel at all pregnant. So we said, well, I don't think it's likely that I'm pregnant. 
the course of action would be to have a lumpectomy to take out this lump. So what was recommended was that I did a pregnancy test before my pre-op tests at the hospital just to be absolutely certain. So that's what I did and um, it was unbelievable. It actually showed positive. So that was a real shock. Well, it should be good news. You know, we, we wanted another child, so, but it's, um, you don't know whether to feel uh, happy or, or not really. You don't know uh, what's going to happen. Um, so it's, uh, it's a question of uh, finding out uh, what, what, um, what could be done, really. Especially as, at the time, the consultant had said, well, if you are pregnant, I'm not really sure whether you could have treatments. I'm not sure what the latest information is with regards to your outcome. Yeah, didn't really know what was going to happen. So very uncertain. It just didn't seem real. And one way of dealing with this extreme emotion, in a way, is to sort of block it off. And I just felt like I was not really in this world. I didn't feel like I was really quite with it. I didn't feel happy about being pregnant because I didn't know whether or not I'd be able to have the baby. I couldn't believe it. Oh, that was more than awful. And I didn't want to accept it. So, well, shocking. It was shocking. And when she said it and was in the kitchen, she cried, but I cried louder. It was so sad. I just couldn't believe it. It, it. it jumped on me. So Roland and I went into the hospital to meet up with our consultant. And um, he and the oncologist at the hospital were absolutely amazing because what they'd done in the meantime, in those days in between meeting up with them again, they had really thoroughly researched what the latest um, advice was with regards to treating somebody with breast cancer whilst they're pregnant and they had evidence from past cases that had been documented from the United States. This paper had been written by a doctor in the United States. It had shown that it was in fact possible to have chemotherapy whilst pregnant provided you had passed the first trimester. So at that point I was only five weeks pregnant. That meant delaying my chemotherapy because of this, it was best for me to have the surgery as soon as possible. In the meantime, the results had come back from the biopsy, which had given them more information regarding the type of cancer and the stage and how aggressive it was. And their advice was that it would be best to have a full radical mastectomy because if I had a lumpectomy first, they felt the chances were that it wouldn't be enough to clear the cancer and that I would have to go back for a second surgery, which would heighten the risk of miscarriage because being under the general anaesthetic was a risk within itself. I told my friends I didn't want anyone to visit me. It's been a long time, so it's difficult to talk about it. I felt like a slab of meat. It was horrible. They drew all over my chest with a marker pen. It was really horrible. But in any case, um, I had the operation and um, then I was waiting for blood to appear. <laughs> to see if I'd have a miscarriage or not. And um, when it had got to a couple of days and nothing appeared, so that was, that first hurdle was over, you know. You know, my husband, you know, Roland came and visited me and I let my mum come and see me. But apart from that, I just did not want to see anybody. 
Um, at that point, I hadn't really told anybody that I was pregnant because um, Roland and I didn't know where we stood. I was told both the fact that Caroline was pregnant and had cancer in the same breath, and that was a great shock. I couldn't believe it. Like Barbara, I suddenly thought, I was just so shocked. And uh, I think I had, I, I actually felt chilled, um, very cold, and um, again, that sort of uh, slightly surreal feeling. Um, did I hear that right? I remember going for a walk, I was going for a walk, and then you were saying that you were pregnant. And of yes. course, when you, somebody tells you they're pregnant, you think, oh, that's brilliant, you know? Yeah. And then I remember part of my brain thought, oh my God, what about the treatment? Yeah. You know, you've got cancer. Yeah. You know, is, is everything going to be all right? Is yeah. the baby going to be all right? I was frightened stiff. Only frightened that the child wouldn't be good or maybe misformed. And uh, there was for her a hard time, but for me too. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can't describe things like that. No, it was very sad. When my mother told me, I felt really scared that of the prospect that I might have died and really grateful at the same time because if she hadn't taken that risk, then I would have died. Having Max was probably um, a good distraction from the situation, really. Um, I'm not the sort of person to really dwell on uh, what's happening, and I would need uh, other things. I would need to keep busy, and the one, the one thing about a one year old is that you are kept busy with the things that you have to do. And so, yeah, Max would definitely have been, uh, you know, a happy distraction. I was really concerned, I have to say, because at that time, I don't think there'd been an awful lot of um, publicity on any re research that had been carried out. Certainly I wasn't aware of any. So I was, I was in my mind thinking of all the options available to Caroline. And I can't remember what we actually spoke about Caroline, but certainly, I was certainly concerned for you and for the baby as well, um, regarding all the options. I was concerned the fact that you mentioned that you wouldn't be having um, the uh, radiotherapy until mm -hmm. after Luke was born. I was concerned about that, and that you wouldn't be able to take all the drugs that the um, would be advisable in pregnancy, all the um, chemotherapy drugs, I was concerned about that. And obviously, being aware that these drugs do cross the placental barrier, uh, I was concerned, you know, what would happen to, what would happen to the baby um, were you to go ahead with the treatment. It was very difficult finding the answer as to how can it be possible to have the chemotherapy and it not affect the baby and it wasn't until literally about a week before my first chemotherapy treatment that I got an answer from one of the nurses at the hospital that it was because the placenta acts as a barrier to some medication and it doesn't allow it through to the baby to the fetus that for me was enough reassurance at that time to be able to go through with it. I uh, fully trusted the doctors. I did a lot of uh, googling really to find out the, uh, the paper that they gave us had some references and so uh, tried to find out as much information. The actual chemotherapy itself um, all went okay. The very first one I found really tough when they put the needle in my arm and they were going to put the, the, the drugs through. I was really upset and it was just horrible um, because I'm worried about the baby. And also I just, I'm one of these people, unless that I really need to take a headache tablet, I don't, I just sort of manage. They gave me anti-sickness drugs. They said that I needed to take them because obviously if I was sick, then that wouldn't be good for myself or for the pregnancy. But on the other side, 
I also didn't really want to take them because for me it was just more medication going into my body. So what I ended up doing, it's probably, I don't know if it's quite right saying this on film, but I kind of self-medicated in terms of, I did take a few of the anti-signet tablets, but when I found that I actually felt okay, then I reduced them and I didn't take as much. And one time I reduced it a bit too much and was nearly sick. So then I got to know what I could take and what I couldn't take. One of the things that did happen after my first chemotherapy, I woke up in the middle of night, absolute agony, really chronic pain out of the blue. And I couldn't even walk to the car. I could just about stumble into the car. Roland took me to the hospital in the morning and we didn't know what on earth was wrong. There I was at the hospital. Roland had to get a wheelchair. I was in so much pain to get me in to um, A&E and after investigating it they found in fact it was chronic appendicitis. Then of course it was, oh my goodness, how do we treat this lady who's pregnant, she's got a low in immune system from her chemotherapy and she's got this appendicitis. Now, the doctor said in normal circumstances, they would have whipped it out, no questions, because it was so bad. But there I was being admitted into hospitals and on intravenous antibiotics. And then it was a question of waiting and seeing, will that clear it up? Thank goodness it did. It's a very stressful time. Um, and uh, you know how all-consuming having a, a, a family can be with uh, everything that you've got to do. For me, it's a case of uh, getting your head down and getting through everything you've got to do one step at a time, really. I didn't have a miscarriage and I was being able to be treated and being reassured that that would be successful. So we found that, oh gosh, we're so lucky that we can have our baby and we did have a laugh as well. You know, I said to Roland, gosh, you never, when you married me, you never thought that I'd be uh, taking my breast off before going to bed and putting it back on in the morning because I've got a prosthesis. Of course, when I first started chemotherapy, you couldn't see that I was pregnant because it was such early days. But towards the end, of course, it was clear that I was pregnant and I felt very uncomfortable going to the chemotherapy unit. So I was very aware of the fact that it must look very strange to those people that here I am having chemotherapy. The first couple of times Roland came with me, but I was also aware that he'd taken a lot of time off work and I was a bit, you know, thinking, well, the next one I'll be fine, you know, the third one I'll just go on my own, that's absolutely fine. But I did find that having gone to one on my own, I actually then got nightmares. So um, <laughs> I obviously wasn't fine. And then after that, um, a couple of different friends came with me and my mum came with me and I know it's particularly difficult for my mum because she hates hospitals, she's got a real phobia about hospitals but she did come with me and she was really pleased she did because I think she found that it wasn't half as bad as how she'd pictured it in her mind. She had the cap here and it was very, very cold. Yeah, and we held each other's hands and so on, and it's, that last bit was painful, and being mother and see your daughter having pain. Then you think, oh, well, I wish I could do something. You do suffer that one of your children is in that situation. And Carla was brave enough, she, she didn't let go. Roland and I had loads of hospital appointments, and my parents looked after Max. So that was a really big help. When she went to the hospital, there was no problem to go along us, put Max out, and he was happy. And there was, that was no trouble. And for us, it was fine. Yeah, to have young life around you. You know, it was a very good pregnancy. Um, I had no problems at all. 
and I did go full term and have him naturally. So, you know, we were just over the moon. And as soon as Luke was born, we could see straight away that he was very healthy, absolutely fine, no problem at all. It was just a wonderful time. It was three o'clock in the morning and she rang me straight away. And 12 o'clock I was there and oh, that is one of my most happy moments in my life. Oh, this, you can't give words for it. So beautiful baby. This is my look. See, he held my finger six years old, six uh, hours. hours. Sort of the next five years, I just sort of threw all my energy into Max and Luke and enjoying them and being with them while they growed up. But I found that once they started school, I then had a bit more time to think about what had gone on and I really did feel the need to talk to somebody. There wasn't anybody that I knew of in the same or similar situation that I could speak to. And when I was actually diagnosed, the nurses said to me, we have got a, counts a cancer counsellor at the hospital and if you ever feel that you'd like to talk to somebody, then please give her a call. So I thought, I don't need to see a counsellor. That's surely for somebody that's got a certain prognosis of actually not going to survive. My prognosis was a moderate prognosis, so, you know, we focused on that I was going to survive and be, be well. But in any case, when it got to five years on, I thought, well, actually, I could really do with talking to somebody because I felt these sort of kind of situations sometimes that I thought, oh, I really need to talk to someone. Um, so, for example, I felt like there was an almost like an inner anger sometimes that was waiting to sort of pounce out that was stronger than normal and I felt that it was possibly to do with my fear of the unknown. If something didn't feel quite right in my body, I'd be worried that it was the cancer that had come back. And so I had some scary moments. There was one time where I thought I had um, uh, mouth cancer and I was Googling online what looked like what I had in my mouth and I really freaked out and I got really upset. So um, I did contact the counsellor at the hospital and she was really helpful and I'm so pleased I did it because the things that I was going through, it showed that it was normal. And yes, it was due to the fact that it was this anxiety caused by having been diagnosed with cancer. Me and Mum do research with Professor Armand and a couple of other um, Belgian, French, Dutch um, scientists. And I do it because I know that if we do it, then more people, more children in the same situation that uh, me and mum were in, that it will help them and more babies like me will survive.